Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. G'day, g'day, g'day. My name is Adam Jones. Today we are reviewing the click moment, seizing opportunity in an unpredictable world, unpredictable world by Frange Johan Sasson. Two S's there. Nice pronunciation. Yeah. Mate, okay. I thought this was a really, uh, really bloody good book, actually. I... It was a lot of stories, obviously very, very well researched, very thorough, a lot of examples, a lot of stories, must have been bloody tough to write, mm. but then like the, the second half was uh, very applicable, very actionable, I liked it. Very actionable, and a lot of this stuff, uh, I think we said before, a lot of the best books, I think, are things that are common sense, but once you read it, it's it's like you've always known it, but... Uh, you need a book to bring the ideas to your mind and a lot of those kind of ideas are in this book and yeah. and the idea of which we're, we're going to get into a purposeful bet was, yeah, fucking, fucking nice. sick, basically. Mate, there was someone the other day who was saying, oh, you guys always say the first half's better than the second. Do you even read it all? Or? <laughs> but this is what I'm going to say, the second half's better than the first. Yep. <laughs> yep. But yeah, so it's sort of like the first half is, is setting up, just almost highlighting that the world is random and then the second half uh, shows how can you capitalize on that randomness, yeah? Yep, definitely. So, yeah, I, I was definitely sold on the idea at the very start that uh, success is random. So I don't we... like to admit it. I'd like to say success is... Well, yeah, we definitely it. don't. Like, I think it's, it's something also in um, uh, Daniel, Kahn- Daniel Kahneman, yeah. Thinking Fast and Slow, that we, we like to um, mm. think give that meaning. we give meaning to yeah. everything rather than just think it's just unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. So... But we can capitalize on the unpredictability. Let's yep. get into it. Part one, an unpredictable world. Uh, yep. And he talks about, so as, as you said, he gives a lot of examples, a lot of stories. He talks about Numa Numa, that song, Dragosta Dinte. I, I, I don't know it. How's it going? You don't know it. I don't know it when I hear it. <laughs> Come on, mate. Mate, we'll play it afterwards. <laughs> but right. basically saying like, it smashed it in Europe and it was like number one and they like did... They did like six different versions in different languages. And in like the French top 10, all six were in the top 10 at one point. But it just never made it in the US. Yeah, so they spent a lot of money on marketing and everything like that. And like to the letter of the law, to the book, they did everything they could to get into the US, they thought. Mm. Correct? And then... They just uh, never cracked it until... Until what happened? Until so, there was this like, just like this guy, like this crazy sort of pretty fat guy with a beard just like filmed himself on a video singing the song really animated really over the top um, yep. lip syncing to it and that just went viral and then the song from there caught on yeah and then all of a sudden it was number one in, in the US yeah. after after six weeks so it goes through a lot of stories like this so for example the the man who let desperate housewives and lost through uh, on the TV network he was out of a job before they even started so all the mm. CEOs and the people who supposedly knew everything. So the CEO of Disney said, this is never gone, going to work. So they fired him and, <laughs> and then obviously they, they were the TV hit series of that year. Yeah, and basically it said like, was it on the ABC or whichever channel Lost was on was basically dead. Yeah. And then Lost came on and it was like the biggest show of the decade and just smashed it and saved them basically. Yeah. Another one, uh, Bill Bro. Bro woman uh, from Nike, he always was grappling with the spikeless uh, sports shoe. But one day he mm. saw someone, I think, pull his mum grab some like you know chocolate waffles or something <laughs> yeah. from, uh, from uh, the waffle machine, and then then he had this idea pop in his head, and then he put latex into the waffle machine, and then he came up with the Nike shoe. Yeah, the base of the shoe there. Another look, just quick one: Barack Obama. Prior to two thousand and four, he had little or no chance of winning the presidency. His keynote. Sh- uh, speech in 2004 Senate uh, just announced that Barack Obama was on the scene and then this man. this spread virally to millions then all of a sudden uh, everyone was like who the fuck is this yeah. dude and then he all of a sudden yeah. became the president of the US yeah nice so there's heaps of these stories really interesting to read really tough I don't know how the hell he weaved them all together but it works yeah um, he, he talks about Serena Williams then she won the US Open when she was 17 years old when she was three years old, she was practicing tennis two hours a day, yeah. every day, because her dad was just like, Serena and, Ve- and Venus, you guys are going to be tennis champions. And the reason that that worked, which is where that the outliers or the 10,000 hour rule, all of those types of things come together, is if you like focus on something with fixed rules, mm. basically the same. So tennis, there's the same rules, tennis is always the same, 
it's a very limited amount of things that you can do within tennis, like yep. hit the ball back over. So you can master something like that. Yeah, definitely. So th- that was really refreshing to yeah. hear that you yeah. don't need... Uh, so there are some things that the 10th hours an hour rule by Malcolm Gladwell applies to, like violin and uh, chess. Not, not by Malcolm Gladwell, but oh, popularized by? by Malcolm Gladwell. Popularized by Malcolm yeah. Gladwell, correct. But what she says is things like... Uh, there's a lot of things that go against the rule. Like Richard Branson started starting Virgin or Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix. Mm. They didn't have pretty much any experience. It just came out of nowhere. Yeah, really. so she says that the rules of business and things like that are always changing. So the 10,000 hour rule doesn't necessarily apply to things like business. But if you're going for violin or languages, if you're not yeah. Tim Ferriss, then, then yeah, <laughs> go for 10,000 hours practice. Yeah, exactly. Whereas there's random things, as you say, mate, it's refreshing to know that you don't need that 10,000 hours. Yeah, you can, yeah. you can, uh, this is what, and this is where the book, whole book comes in. For the, the things that don't take 10,000 hours, that takes a lot of unpredictability and uncertainty and chance, how mm. you can, uh, take hold of that in, uh, in a good way to, yeah, to have the best opportunity of success. Yeah. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, and so that was one type. So like tennis or maybe chess or something where the rules are always the same, where you need those 10,000 hours. But something that's where the rules are completely different or the rules can be changed can be up for anything. So basically they said Nokia mm. was the number one um, It was the number one phone seller, weren't they? Yes, that's right. So in 2007, the way Fran says it is Nokia was the Serena Williams of mobile phones. They had yep. a market capital of 160. Two billion dollars. So everyone in the world at that time was thinking they are the absolute bomb. Everyone who knew everything thought Nokia is, you know, going to going to rule the world basically. But what it managed to do in the next few years is drop ninety percent when uh, iPhones came on the market. Yeah, basically they're like, what the hell is this iPhone? It wasn't what people expected a phone to be. Yep. They changed the rules and dominated, and not Nokia was cooked. That's right. Uh, so they they said one of the uh, leading authorities. On it, so a CEO of a leading tech site said Apple is about to come out with a new phone and it will largely fail. Yeah. So yeah. Again, it's those people who it just shows the the unpredictability of yeah. Apple succeeding at the time. Even then, these experts who just didn't didn't get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another cool story about Google and that uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin when they were setting it up, they didn't realize it was going to be big, so they wanted to sell it, and um, I think they were willing to sell it for a million yep. at the time, and that was in 1998. Yahoo offered them 750K. They thought about taking it. In the end, so from 1998, they wanted to sell it for a million. By 2002, after Yahoo, who was the leading search engine, uh, passed on it, it was up to 3 billion in 2002. Oh, sorry, Yahoo offered 3 billion. Yep. And then two years later, oh, because people at Yahoo were like, three billion, that's way too much, don't do it. Mm. Two years later, it was 150 billion. Yeah. <laughs> and even and from now, it just keeps going up. Yeah. So, yeah. So, even at Yahoo, who was the number one search engine in the world, undervalued Google yep. um, for that three billion and went up to 150 billion in two years. Yeah, fucking love it, man. Uh, so, yeah, we're quickly flipping through the start. The next chapter was the twilight of logic. So, this is uh, about how Twilight got started. So the chick, Stephanie Mayer, woke up from an incredibly vivid dream and then she just thought, yep, I'm going to start writing about this dream and then she went on a rampage. She ended up with a 498-page story and uh, she was going to throw it in the bin and not do anything with it but then her her sister picked it up and urged her, you know, just send it to a publisher, see what happens and uh, they took the chance, did that. Then all of a sudden, Twilight was released and she's, you know, on top of the world, one of the highest selling book sales of all time and basically that's highlighting the fact that the less rules there are the less experience is required so Stephanie she wasn't a writer by any means she was (laughs) just she just as you said had a dream and woke up and just started writing it out and because like something like fiction something like this fantasy stuff there's no rules so because there's no rules you don't need as much experience love it and then uh, chapter 5 which we'll get into now is the conspiracy of randomness which we kind of mentioned at the start but it's we want to think things happen for a reason and we should be able to understand those reasons and we think it's unfair to attribute something to luck when someone gets successful that yeah to actually say you know luck had a big part in it and uh she she goes on here a bit about the mate you are you talking about the author she oh yeah (laughs) 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 mate is france france 
Yeah, I know. Yeah. But even Melbourne, like, I don't know. <laughs> for a Western Melbourne Australian name, it sounds like a dude. France. Yeah, oh, I don't know. Anyway, we've got France coming on. So <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully France didn't listen to that part. But anyway... <laughs> what he talks about is the World Rock P- Paper Scissors Society. Yeah. And the World Rock Paper Scissors Society fucking writes books about the, you know, the, the rock rock strategy, yeah. strategy opening and the Spanish Armada <laughs> double set. And they're just playing fucking rock, paper, scissors. But they're coming up with all these ideas to get successful in it. They're, they're fucking, yeah. They smoke crack all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, what they're saying is that uh, the rock, paper, scissors paradox is that you know you want to think that there's a strategy and there's a way to win but the best way to win is to be random yeah just randomly throw it out you think oh the most common one you put out is rock so then i if, if they know that the most common one to put out is rock then they're going to go paper but then i think if you know that they know then actually maybe you should go scissors and <laughs> so they're trying to come up with all these strategies as you said there was like there's all these different strategies but at the end of the day the best strategy is to be random yeah and I guess why we want to make sense of the world, like you said, thinking fast and slow. We want to give a story to it. But we also want to believe that there is like a defined path. We want to know this is the path. These are the steps you take to emulate someone else's success. And we want to follow it. But at the end of the day, maybe there's not that defined path, yeah. unfortunately. Bang on, mate. Go part two of the book there. Yep. I haven't got anything for chapter six, but feel free to hear it. Yeah, I don't know much. I was just trying to scroll through the book. To yeah. See, yeah. Anyway. No, nice. So part two is... Uh, seizing opportunity. Cool. So there's three things that you can do to seize opportunity. And they are quick moments, purposeful bets, and complex forces. Yep. So what are quick moments? So quick moments are... I think the best way of describing this is maybe through the story, they say, of, of Microsoft, which I think yep. I briefly mentioned in another podcast, but worth, worth mentioning again. So... A few people met at a party through all these complex forces and they and a by chance encounter and then mm-hmm. they started uh, they had the, the right technical skills colliding and somewhere in the middle they thought of the idea of Windows three coming yeah. together. So at the time Windows and Microsoft they were starting to do pretty average. Yeah. And they wanted to have this Windows three where all the things that we know today, like Word, Excel and PowerPoint, they're already all there built in. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about buying all these different things. And they, they should want to partner with IBM, was it? Correct. Yep. They want to partner with someone else. But then these two dudes were like, nah, we can do this. Yeah. Didn't they do, just do it themselves yep. on a weekend? So on a weekend, they, the, they left the party straight away and they went home and started developing it. And uh, this kind of ties in, which we're going to unpack a bit more, is, is the idea of purposeful bet. So what Microsoft mm. did with this is they've got 8,000 employees. They let these three people go off and then yep. this was a, a little bet by Microsoft where they're taking a chance mm. and these three people ended up doing a lot of work on it developing it and then they're the ones who actually sub- basically saved, yeah. saved, saved Microsoft. Microsoft yeah that's sick so quick moments are those things that just I guess pop in your idea and say after a big bout of success you're looking back mm. and you realise that's that's where it all started just those moments where things click together and yeah and uh, yeah, you went with it. Yeah, nice. And just to throw back to Rework, which uh, it wasn't <laughs> one of your favorite books, yeah. but uh, they took that, they had that inspiration and they went and did it straight away. They didn't say, oh, let's, it was a Friday night party. They didn't yep. say, let's start Monday. They're like, no, nah, let's do it this weekend. Yep. So quick <laughs> moments elicit an emotional response such as awe, excitement or happiness. So you got an irrationally strong desire to take the idea to the next level. And, she, and he says... <laughs> Act on quick moments straight away. When you got yep. them, do something with do. them because, as you said, inspiration is perishable. And we, uh, we've been saying that we don't believe these, or not, not don't believe, but didn't expect these quick moments to exist before reading this book. But then most people experience this serendipity in their romantic life. Mm. Whereas, you know, oh, we love at first sight or I just run into this chick at a bar or whatever. So yep. we need to put ourselves out there more and more to have more chance of having these serendipitous quick moments in our romantic life yeah uh but we don't really think that that then translates to other areas of life which this book is saying that it does yes spot on so that's goes into how to create quick moments which is chapter eight yep so what he recommends is to take your eye off the ball every now and then and connect with all the possibilities around you explore things uh not connected to your immediate goals yeah so you got all you, you start uh relating with all the other complex forces around you. Yeah, definitely. 
And the best example of this he uses is Howard Schultz, the who's credited as I guess the head of Starbucks. Yeah. And so Starbucks was initially just in Seattle, I believe, just a shop that sold ground coffee and equipment that you can make coffee at home. It wasn't the Starbucks we knew today where it's an actual you go in and buy a cup of coffee. Mm. And so Howard Schultz went to Milan in Italy to go to an expo that was about home brewing, like home coffee equipment. And as he was walking down the streets, he sees all these people walking into uh, espresso bars, coffee places, buying a cup of coffee, having a chat with the barista and walking out, which was just a completely foreign concept. In America, it didn't happen. Yeah, that's right. And so even though his ultimate goal was to go there to research home coffee equipment, he found this espresso bar concept and brought it back to America and absolutely fucking dominated. Yeah, that's right. I think Tony Robbins actually mentioned this. You're not going to get anywhere if you value certainty so high. So he says Mm. you have to value uncertainty to uh, let these other ideas and and things flow through your life. And I think this ties ties in really nicely to that idea. Yeah. So that was part one was take your eyes off the ball. The next uh, thing you should do to create click moments is using intersectional thinking. So merging two different concepts together or find that intersection between two different ideas. That's huge. So if you're, say, a consultant for anything at home, you might be a lawyer or something, learning skills like maybe how to use a a product like Camtasia or Mm. develop an online course, if you you do intersect those skills, you might have an online course in in law or something like that and then all of a sudden you've got a whole new new product line or something. And the example he uses here is a... a Muslim woman, I think she was from Australia, called Ahida Zanetti, who, Australia, obviously, big beach culture, but in the Muslim culture, you have to wear the full um, full body coverage. I forget what it's uh, called here. Yeah. Uh, but so then she merged those two ideas of, of very uh, extremely low coverage of the beach with extremely high coverage of, uh, of the Muslim culture and made the burkini. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, number three which is follow your curiosity. Yes. Sorry, man. Let me keep Sorry. going. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like the, the Muslim chick on the beach, she probably thought, hey... How come I can't go to the beach yeah. too? And I think, yeah. I think she, yeah, then she develops the same thing for, for netballers and things yep. like that. So, so for a, a special netball dress for Muslim netballers to wear. Yep. And, um, then, and number four, reject a predictable path. Yep. And yeah, pretty much you're not going to find anything click moment worthy on the predictable path. Yeah, if your whole week you know exactly what's coming and you're not getting outside your comfort zone at all and you're just going to go through the motions and then time is just going to pass and then maybe you're going to go through years when really nothing happens and mm. and yeah. Yeah, pretty much if there was a click moment on the predictable path, it's already been found. Yeah, correct. You're not going to find it. Yep. Cool. So the next that was click moments. The next part is purposeful bets. Yeah, both of our favorite chapters. Yeah, definitely. So it's just saying that the click moment it has to be followed by action. If yep. you see the click moment and realize there's potential here, you got to do something about it. Yeah. So if you've got a click moment, say you've got a mortgage on a house, a purposeful bet would not be to sell your whole mortgage and invest all your time and quit your job and all your money and mm. dump your wife and fucking <laughs> get rid of your kids. <laughs> It'll be to have... He's got this idea of this minimum bet. So you're going to yeah. invest a minimal amount of time, money, reputation, and energy to actually yeah. test the idea of this bet. And then yeah. if it's good, then you move on with it and then you invest more into it. And he says that more isn't necessarily better. And again, he gives a, a bunch of things, but it's saying like, if you had $500 million to start a company, you're going to behave differently. Whereas if you had $1 million to start this product, because you're going to waste a lot of... Yep. a lot of those resources. So more is definitely not necessarily better. As you said, you need to invest that amount of time, money, effort, energy, reputation, but don't throw it all on the line in one hit because yep. success is random. If the first one doesn't work, you're fucked. Whereas if you do a small amount and it doesn't work, you're still ready to go for the next one. That's right. So what Franz recommends is place a lot of these little minimum bet sizes in, in a lot of different areas and when things take off, Take hold of that and then focus your energy onto that. Yeah. So the opposite of that, as you were saying, is you, you try really hard at this one thing and then, <laughs> and then you keep, <laughs> and then you keep just trying at that, not trying anything else, and then you really get no. Yeah, exactly. Want. So we've got something more now. <laughs> Mate, I like you, the concept of risk homeostasis. Yeah. And then you're talking about parachuters. In that, uh, I think it was in the '90s, parachutes became way safer. Yeah. But the amount of people that died 
stay the same. Less people were dying from failure of the of the equipment, but more people were taking more risks and doing more risky maneuvers and were dying that way. Yep. And the same as, say, mass condom um, distribution through Africa to try and stop AIDS or HIV, people then take have more risky sex, and that actually meant the same amount of HIV and AIDS was... Um, was uh, yeah, fucking passed on. Passed. What, was the, what was the word I was thinking? <laughs> no, just fucking... Just, just you know. inter- <laughs> I forget the word. Yeah. So, <laughs> so just with that, calculate affordable loss yep. as opposed to return on investment. Yeah. And he says it's better... If you've got a chunk of money, for example, it's better to split that up six ways and have six chances yep. than put it all on the line in one hit. Yep. And then... Also, another one, use passion as your fuel. Yep, nice. So just with that, you're, you're definitely going to be able to take the minimum bet further when you're half passionate about something, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do we say the smallest... Oh, the smallest executable step as well. Yeah. The example of uh, Starbucks again was Howard Schultz and the Starbucks people who he was working for already had that one shop, so they didn't like try and get millions of dollars in funding and open up shops all over the country. Just in that one shop they already had, they just got a coffee machine and started trying to sell cups from that one store. Yep. And they had lines out the door, so that sort of proved their concept, so they opened a second one. Um, but that first smallest executable step was just to, in their existing store, have a coffee machine that sold single cups yep. as well. Yeah, spot on, mate. Then next chapter was chapter 11, which is complex forces. Yeah, so this is, I guess, once you've, you've had that click moment, you've placed your purposeful bet by taking action, now complex forces happen. Yeah, <laughs> Shit that's just starts right. happening. <laughs> that's right. So chapter 12, which is next chapter, how to harness complex forces. Yeah. This is also something I really liked. So yeah. one first principle, create large hooks. So you have to, if you're going to take hold of these complex forces, you have to do something. Yeah. Who knows? You could be an absolute YouTube star, YouTube hit, getting tens of millions of views, but you're never going to know unless you let these complex forces take hold of your ideas. That might be, you know, putting in that minimum bet to make a YouTube channel about something you're passionate about. Yeah. Who knows? It might be a fucking flonk and no one listens to it or watches it. But who knows? (laughs) Complex complex forces may take it to the next level and people start listening to it and... Yeah, for sure. Some of these complex forces include unintended consequences or the cascade or the butterfly effect where you do one small thing and it builds up and builds up until something big happens yep. or a self-reinforcing loop. Yep. And so as you say, put yourself out there. The next uh, part of that was take a closer look at surprises. And it's like, oh, if, if you think, oh, that's, that was a surprising outcome, yep. uh, maybe investigate that a little further. Yep. So like uh, they use the example of Viagra. It was initially used to treat the heart mm. and blood pressure and stuff, and then they realized people were getting boners from it. Getting stiffy. Yeah. <laughs> so then they're like, oh, maybe we can like make uh, some boner pills. Yeah. And basically, it became what the... They've saved a lot of marriages. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, financially, they've dominated as well. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah. it's a great product for Agra. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking from experience or... Once or twice, <laughs> just to just to test the waters, but you know, placing a minimum bet with Viagra is nothing. Wrong. Next is uh, look for an opening. Yeah, and that's just that opportunity. He says an opening it may not be open for too long, so when there's an opening, you need to be prepared to make a quick decision before it shuts yep. up again. Next principle: spot momentum and intensity. Yeah, when something's going, fucking keep it going. And then number five, probably the most <laughs> important, is. Double down. So when something's starting to take off and it's and this minimum bet you've done is actually looking at turning out to be a very good bet you've placed, then double down and start investing your time, money, and reputation when it's going good because then then this will be the thing that leads you to uh, potentially where you want to go. Yeah, exactly. And he talks a lot about porn in that section, so that's worth a read. Yeah. The double down bit. Yep, spot yeah, spot on. Uh, that brings us to the epilogue. And basically the three takeaways... From the epilogue, um, the world is unpredictable and random, and so if if you're in a something where the rules are not locked in, and these rapid changes means that success is even going to become even more and more random. Yep, uh, is one. Another one is uh, we are truly reluctant to attempt to court randomness. So no one's actually trying to get randomness through these click moments, personal bets, and yep. complex forces. And number three is we cannot control complex events, but we can recognise when things are moving in our favour. And that's when you said, see that momentum double down. Yeah, definitely. And just on 
number point number one you made there. Mm-hmm. I, it's an absolute no-brainer. I think that these complex forces and unpredictability are just going to get more and more mm. and more and more unpredictable with the the future that's coming. Love it. So, mate, absolutely. I really, really like the book. I haven't mm. really. It's not one of the biggest books in the world, is it? But it's, no, I don't even know how I found this. Yeah. I, where did it come from? Just popped up on on good, <laughs> good reads and yeah. yeah, clicks want to read. But yeah, mate, the, yeah, the idea of minimum bet size and purposeful bets, it's it's fucking awesome. I think yeah, because it's so true. If you just have so many, if you place a lot of minimum bets and then some things take off, just latch yeah. on to them and off you go. Love yeah. it, love it. So, mate, any concluding? Nah, that's that sounds good. It's time to fucking rock. <laughs> yeah, rock it. Let's rock the shit, baby. <laughs> Moment by Franz Johansson. No, baby, your theory of success. Success. Seizing opportunity in an unpredictable world. Serena Williams with a really big bum. Hitting tennis ball for 10,000 hours. Now look at her, she's really good. She's really good. Just like a sister. Step one, find a click moment. Step two, place a purposeful bet. Then you can let those complex forces take control and get you success. Look at now, year 2007. 162 billion market dollar capital. They fucked it up when C. Jobs came along and threw the iPhone on the bone. That was a quick moment. Bob friends, show your hands. Click it there, click it for it, just click it again, click it for it, click, just click it for it, just click.